I can't tell you how happy I am to be here. The scriptures say in 3 John, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. And to see former students of yours loving Jesus and loving people to Jesus and encouraging people in Jesus, this is a great privilege of, for me to be here with you. Your pastor loves you and he talks about you and he prays for you and I'm grateful to be here to encourage you. I'd like to turn your attention to one passage of scripture. It's in 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. It's my favorite passage. And it simply says this, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed upon him purifies himself just as he is pure. Let's pray. O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for how much you love us. And I pray, Father, that not a person in this room would leave not being overwhelmed with your love. Uh, everyone would leave overwhelmed with your love for them. And I pray, Father, for that to happen. I believe that something supernatural has to occur. I know, Father, that what I offer to these folks is not much more than crumbs. But when Andrew brought to your son five loaves and two fish, it wasn't much more than crumbs either for the people that needed to be fed. And yet your son took those crumbs and broke them and blessed them and multiplied them and everybody left satisfied. I ask this morning that your Holy Spirit would take the offering that is given this morning and that each person here would hear particularly what he or she needs and would be encouraged and would know that you individually spoke to each one. Father, I pray that this would happen and I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. My, my best friend at Wheaton College is the theater professor. His name's Mark Lewis. He used to be in the soap operas in New York City. He used to perform on Broadway. He loves Jesus with intensity. And he grew up on the mission field. He was born in Argentina. He was the eighth born child in his family. And his father was a good guy, I knew him, but he was a little bit rigid in his faith, fundamentalist somewhat, tender-hearted, but kind of stiff and had no room for the arts, and Mark was an artist. And he just thought that he wasn't on his parents' radar screen, so when he was six years old, he decided he was gonna show his parents how much he loved them. One of the older siblings was supposed to be watching him, you know how that goes. So he broke out his crayons, his felt-tip markers, his paints, his colored pencils, and he spent the entire day painting a mural up the white wall of the back of their house. And the whole time he's saying, when dad and mom see this, they're going to know how much I love them. He imagined them bringing in the neighbors and saying, look what Mark did for us. He's an artist and look how he showed it to us by showing his love for us with this great work of art. Well, when his parents came home, it didn't quite go like he had imagined it would. And he was spanked and disciplined. And he said the sad thing for him was that his parents didn't see what he was trying to show them. Fast forward many years later. He's directing the autumn play at Wheaton College. His days, he gets up, he helps his wife get the kids ready for school. He rushes off to school, teaches classes, grades papers, meets with students, does faculty governance meetings. After a busy day, he comes home for one hour to collect himself before he has to go back for rehearsals that go long into the night. And after about three or four weeks of this, he's pretty weary and he comes home for that one hour break and he sees his six-year-old daughter, Ruby, standing on a chair at the sink with a plastic basin in the sink. And the water's going full bore and splashing everywhere. And Mark's thinking, I came home for a little rest. I got to clean up this mess. He gets up. He says, Ruby, honey, what are you doing? Ruby bursts into tears. And Mark's wife, Mary, says to Mark, Mark, she knew you were weary. She was just getting water in a basin so she could wash her feet. And Mark immediately remembers his own six-year-old experience. And he says, oh, Ruby, honey, I'm so sorry. Let me help you with that. And it was the coldest water he said he ever put his feet in in his life. 
He said, you know, I realized at that moment my parents didn't get it right. I got it half right. Maybe one day Ruby will get it all right. Why is that story so moving to us? Because we've all been the one that was misunderstood sometime in our life. And we've also all been the one who did the misunderstanding of the well intention of another person. There's only one person who always gets it right. Donald Miller, who wrote the book Blue Like Jazz, wrote a sequel to it called Searching for God Knows What. And he said when he was in high school, he was always on the fringe of the popular group at school. He longed to break into the inside, but just somehow he was marginalized. One day he was at home, he read a poem, he liked the poem, so he memorized it. About three weeks later, somebody at school said something, and Miller said, oh, that reminds me of a poem, and he recited the poem from memory. And the other students looked at him and said, Miller, you are smart. You are really smart. He said it was the first time he ever felt good about himself. He said two things followed. Number one, he started memorizing more poetry after that. And number two, he realized he needed to gain a sense of himself based on how somebody outside of himself looked at him. And everybody he was looking to for that kind of affirmation was as insecure as he was. There's only one person who can give you the affirmation you need. And that's this God who loves you and loves you unconditionally. I, I saw a movie on an airplane a while back, a long while back, that kind of reminds me of this. Um, I, I don't like to recommend movies I see on airplanes because you don't know how much they've sanitized it for the flight. But nevertheless, I saw this film, and, 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 and I like to think critically about things, the books I read, the movies I see, but I like to let it wash over me first to make sure I'm getting all the material before I start thinking critically about it. So I'm watching this movie, engaged with it, and right towards the end of the movie, there came this scene where I just burst into tears. I don't usually do that. I'm a high T on the Myers-Briggs. I live in my head. I'm not supposed to be emotional, right? But nevertheless, something happened to me in this film, and I think it expresses something I want to get across right now. What was the name of the movie? The Notebook. <laughs> now, whenever I mention it, people laugh. And I think they laugh because it's a chick flick, and I'm not supposed to like chick flicks. But I want you to know I'm secure enough in my manhood, I can watch a chick flick and be okay. So how does this movie go? This old man comes to this rest home. It's played by James Garner. He comes to this rest home to read a story, and he, he walks up to this woman. She's very standoffish, played by Gina Rollins. And he starts to read the story, and an orderly has to tell her it's okay. He comes every day to read stories, and the impression made is this old man in his retirement goes to the rest home to read stories to people who have dementia. And the whole movie is present time, the telling of the story, and past time flashback to the events of the story. There's this young man, played by Ryan Gosling, his first big movie. And he lives in this village. And there's this young girl, played by Rachel McAdams, and it was her first big movie. And she comes with her family to summer at this village in the south, set on a lake. And the impression made is that this wealthy family comes to this village. And there's so much that counts against any relationship developing between this boy and this girl. But a summer romance does develop even though so much is preventing it flourishing. Uh, the boy, he has an education, he has a high school diploma, and he likes the poetry of Walt Whitman. But the girl, she has an education from the best schools her parents' money can afford. Her family's intact, there's a mother and a father, and the daughter, but it's very pretentious. His family, the mother's missing. We don't know if she died or if she divorced, but there's brokenness in this family. And again, so much culturally, family culture, counts against this relationship working. But nevertheless, over the summer, the romance grows, and now the parents of the girl are concerned. They don't want their daughter missing out on their dreams for her, and they don't want her getting stuck with this guy in this small village. So consequently, they're happy to get her out of there when the summer's over. The boy chases after the car, and in his tears, he cries out to her, I'll write to you every day. 
The girl in her tears hears it, but so does the mother, and the mother's at the mailbox every day before the girl can get the letters, and she intercepts the letters, and the girl never hears from the boy. And she said, he said he would write to me every day. I don't hear from him. He writes dutifully every day, and he never hears back. And so much counts against this relationship working. World War II breaks out. And now they're separated by circumstance and geography. And it's about that moment in the movie, the director tips his hand. And we realize it's, it's this old man and this old woman's story. And he comes every day to the hospital to tell her the story of his great love for her because she's living in dementia. And towards the movie, there's this scene where they're sitting in the hospital after he's been reading the story all day, and they're having a nice dinner. There's a rose and a bud vase. There's a candle burning. There's a record player that's playing all the music that was so much a part of their relationship, and the whole thing is pulsating out to this woman, the love of this man for her. And he finishes the story, and she looks at him and says, that's the most beautiful story I have ever heard. And it sounds so familiar. And cognition washes across her face. And she says, it's our story, isn't it? And he says, yes. She says, how much time do we have? He says, last time it was only five minutes. She says, how are the children? That's a question a mother would ask, isn't it? He said, they're fine. They came to see you today. She says, oh, tell them I love them. He says, I will. And while the music's playing, she says, hold me. Can we dance? And they begin to dance across that hospital floor. And as quickly as she came into dementia, she falls out of dementia and finds herself in the hands of a stranger. And she begins to scream. And the orderlies have to come in to sedate her. And James Garner's character is standing against the wall, watching it all, biting his knuckle and weeping. And that was the moment I lost it. Why? Oh, people, because I think it's all of our story. You see, we're all part of an impossible love story. And we live most of our lives in some sort of dementia. And all the time we're being told how much we're loved by this one. And we have those moments where we come into clarity and we begin to see. And then some little inconvenience occurs. Some distraction sets in. And then in that particular moment, we find ourselves screaming upset. When I saw James Garner's character biting his knuckle, weeping, I thought that's a window into the heart of God who loves us even though we live most of our lives as if we're totally unaware of how deep that love is. So this passage in 1 John reacquaints us, wakens us from our dementia, and helps us to see with clarity See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us. I, I, I've worked with college students. I became a Christian when I was in college, and I've spent my life investing in university students because I think when people come to make big decisions to follow Jesus at that period in their life, it, it, it has a positive reverberating effect throughout their days. That's why I've committed myself to this. But every time I've worked with students, I come into some who have bad relations with the Father. For every 10 students I've met that have had a bad relationship with a father, one in 10 have difficulties with the father passages in Scripture because of this projection. But nine out of the 10 with a father hunger take to these passages like ducks to water because they long to have the vacuum filled. Maybe you're here like that, and I want you to know there's a father who loves you, and he is intense in his love for you. And, and I know that we've all had fathers, and I, I'm a father of four children. We have 15 grandchildren. I know that I didn't get it right. I know I made mistakes. But there's one father who always gets it right. Now, there was a guy named uh, Thomas Fuller. He was a 17th century pastor. And he saw in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1 that there were successive generations where one generation kind of got it right and the next generation didn't get it right. And he wrote a devotional on the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. I don't know about you, but if somebody can do devotionals on genealogies, they might have too much time on their hands. But nevertheless, listen to what he wrote. Lord, I find the genealogy of my Savior strangely checkered with four remarkable changes in four immediate generations. 
Number one, Rehoboah begat Abiah, that is a bad father, a bad son. Two, Abiah begat Asa, that is a bad father, a good son. Three, Asa begat Jehoshaphat, that is a good father, a good son. Four, Jehoshaphat begat Joram, that is a good father, a bad son. I see, Lord, from hence that my father's piety cannot be handed on, and that's bad news for me. But I see also that actual impiety is not always hereditary, and that is good news for my son. You've got to appreciate the tenderness of that. We've all had fathers. Some of them have done very well. None of them have done perfectly. Some have done poorly. And all of us who have been fathers know the times when we did well and when we did poorly. But there's one father who always gets it right. And this text says to you about that father, he loves you. People, he loves you. He loves you. The text goes on to emphasize how deep that love is because it says to us in this passage, Beloved, now we're children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that if he should appear, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. One day we're going to see Jesus and that moment is going to be transformative for us. I, 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 you have to take this completely by faith right now, but I played football when I was in college. And, and I remember getting a concussion my senior year. And we were beating this other team 42 to nothing. We had a very good team. But I saw on the film what happened. I had been tackled. I'm sticking out of the pile up, and some guy speared me on the back of the head, and everything went fuzzy for me. And I was pulled from the game. The next Monday, I'm hitting in practice again, banging heads. And that next Saturday, I get another concussion. Everything goes fuzzy. And I, I was a Christian by then. I cried out, said, Lord, please, no. This is my senior year. Don't let this happen. And everything went clear. And I've often thought when we get to heaven, that's what it's going to be like. We found that we've lived our life basically concussed all of our days. And when we get to heaven, there's going to be clarity. And we'll see Jesus as he is. And it says it will be like him. I don't know about you, but I long for the day when all the garbage in my life will finally be eradicated. I'll see with clarity. And I, I wonder what that's going to be like. It says we'll be like him, not in his deity. We'll never be rivals for his omniscience or his omnipotence. We will never have an uncreated past. We will always be like him in his humanity, but never like him in his deity. But you know what that means? We'll be finitely perfect before the infinitely perfect God. The clarity will be there. We will be unconfessed, and we will see him as he is. What's that going to be like? I've had a 35, 38-year discussion with a friend of mine, theological discussion, what our first word will be when we get to heaven. My friend says he thinks it's going to be, oh, Oh, now I see where that person I cared for so deeply hurt me so badly. Oh, now I see why I had to endure that financial reversal. Oh, now I see why that perplexity, that strange thing, I had to endure it for so long. Oh, I see what you were about, God, and all of that. Well, that's interesting and so on, but he's wrong. I think for sure the first word when we get to heaven, when we're finitely perfect before the infinitely perfect, God's going to be, wow! <laughs> wow, I didn't know that about him. If you knew zero to a hundred bits of information of the infinite God, how much more do you have still to know? Infinite amount. You know zero to a thousand bits. You know zero to a billion bits. We'll never get to the bottom of him. We'll be in awe. And we'll say, wow, I don't know if that's ac accurate theologically. Maybe it'll be something more like, oh, wow, I don't know for sure. But nevertheless, one day we'll be like him, which means what? We're not like him now. And you know what the text says about this father's love for you? Beloved, now we are children of God. Messed up as we are. Struggling as we may be, this Father loves us now, before we're fixed. 
It says in 1 John 5, 8, or, or excuse me, Romans 5, 8, but God proved his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How does that work? Let me tell you two quick stories. When our kids were young, my wife and I, we would read books on child rearing. We'd go to seminars. We were trying to figure it out. <clears throat> and you know how it is. Everybody wants to give you advice. And you have the first one. You struggle with trying to apply some of these things. Then you have a second child, and you realize they're completely different than the first one. You've got to go to more seminars, read more books. This is a complex operation, raising kids. We tried to come up with a, a theory on how to discipline our children. What we decided to do is we would never discipline them if we hadn't explained what the infraction was. So if our kids did something that was bad and we hadn't explained it, we wouldn't discipline them, but that was a time for us to explain, here's a new infraction, we don't want you to do this. And our kids were very creative. They kept coming up with new things we had to explain infractions for. But I remember, too, we would sort of measure what the problem was and what did they need as a result. Did they need a timeout? We'd give them a timeout if it wasn't a bad infraction. A timeout as many minutes as they were old. If they were four, they had four-minute timeout. But if they did something that could injure life or limb or themselves or somebody else, they might have to be spanked. And we would go through the discipline like this. We'd say, what did I tell you not to do? You told me not to play in the street, Daddy. What did I say would happen if you played in the street? <laughs> you said you'd spank me, Daddy. What were you doing? I was playing in the street. Do you think I love you any less because you played in the street? No, Dad, you don't love me any less. Is there anything you could ever do that would make me stop loving you? No, Dad, nothing. But am I happy you played in the street? No, Dad, you're not happy. And I would administer my loving kindness to their hindquarters. And I never dismiss them from my presence when I was done disciplining them. I would never say, now go to your room. I didn't want them to think I rejected them as a human being, but only the bad act they did. And so I'd always take them in my arms and I'd hug them and I'd hug them till they were happy. You know what my kids would do as soon as they were disciplined? They'd turn around like that for the hug. And I wanted them to do that in their relationship with God as a father. Go to him in the time of discipline. Go to him in the time when they make these discoveries about things where they've fallen short. Well, I have three boys and one daughter. My three boys would turn around like this for the hug. I'd take them in my arms. We would hug. They'd cry for a little bit. We would start to sway. We'd maybe start to sing a song. And then maybe I'd tickle them and send them on their way. My daughter, Alicia, she she's has her doctorate in psychology. I'm sure I drove her to it. <laughs> she would turn around like this for the hug. And you know what was interesting about it? Every orifice in her face would have leaked. Her eyes would have leaked. Her nose would have leaked. Her mouth would have leaked. And she's turning around like this for the hug. And I'm faced with a moral dilemma. My challenge is I want to say to her, Alicia, I've got that hug for you, but you know, why don't you go shower, clean up a little bit, and you come back and I'll give you that hug. <laughs> but that would have communicated something that I didn't want to communicate. So I'd take her in my arms and I'd hug her and she'd put her head on my shoulder and leave evidence of her DNA all over my clothes. And I learned in those days that every father who loves his child bears a stain because he loves the child. We don't have it together yet. But beloved, now this Father loves us. Now this Father is willing to nurture us into the process of our own development in that love. Another story that might communicate the idea. When I, I, we were young family members, and I mean uh, uh, parents, I was a youth pastor at that time and my wife was a stay-at-home mom. We had four kids. We're trying to make ends meet and it was tight for us financially. Uh, when we, we would go through those childbearing years, my wife hated maternity clothes. And back in those days, you didn't go to these cutesy maternity shops to buy maternity clothes. You had to go to some dark back corner of a women's department store where they had these clothes almost as if they were embarrassed to have to sell clothes like this. And she'd be in these maternity outfits, and she had a couple, and there were some other women in our church who were of, of, of friends of ours who were going through that same period of life, and there was this sort of maternity wardrobe that would go around the church. 
I remember one Sunday coming up to this blonde-haired woman and uh, putting my arm around her and looking at her, and it wasn't my wife. She was in my wife's clothes, but it wasn't her. Well, Claudia always, when she delivered the child, was eager to get out of those maternity clothes, and so we would save up so she could go out and buy two new outfits after the babies were born. Have you ever seen a new mother with a new baby and new clothes where those clothes were in any way compatible with that baby? No, the mother nurses the baby. She puts a diaper on her shoulder to burp the baby. Does the baby hit the diaper? No. But does the mother go around carrying the baby on a stick out here so the clothes won't get messed up? No, every mother who loves her child as much as she likes those clothes, every mother who loves her child bears the stain because she loves the child. Do you see how great this love is for you? And the text goes on to say, everyone who has this hope fixed upon him, everyone who understands in a growing way the love of this father for them, everyone who has this hope fixed on him that one day will be like him, because he's going to transform us. Everyone who has this hope fixed upon him that in these days where we're not transformed yet, but we're in process, believes that now we are children of God. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. What's that like? Now, my father was a Marine during World War II. He was in three D-Day invasions in the South Pacific. He was in the first wave to go ashore at Tarawa the bloodiest battle of World War II for amount of life lost and real estate gained. It was an island the size of the parking lot at the Pentagon. He was in the first wave to go ashore. And there were 1,500 on the beach that he, that was when they misjudged the tides and they didn't get them over the, over the reef. There were 5,000 that went in on that first wave, 30,000 in all, his beach, 1,500. And it took them four hours to get to shore, and by the time they got to shore, there were only 200 able bodies left. He was in the second wave at Saipan. He was in the first wave at Tinian again, and he was horribly injured at Tinian. He had post-traumatic stress disorder. He had OCD. He was a good man. I never heard a foul word come from his mouth. I never heard him say a cross word, even about the people he might have fought in in the war. He respected them. And he was a dear man and a loving man, but I never heard the words that he loved me. He, he was a big guy. My, my younger brother and I both played football. We both used to bench press 400 pounds. We were at a family picnic one time, and, and my dad took a water balloon and threw it at us. And he went running fast, and we took off after him, and he outran us for about 50 yards, but he didn't have much endurance. So he turns around, grabs us both with one hand each, and throws us on the ground. We said, gee, Dad, would you like some more fried chicken and how about some corn on the cob with that? I mean, he was strong and tough, but loving and fun. I never heard him tell me he loved me growing up. He was of that old school where they didn't say those sorts of things. Maybe you knew people like that. But when I was a sophomore in college, he came up and did something very uncharacteristic of him. He looked at me and he said, Jerry, I love you. How do you think I responded? You know, my eyes filled with tears. I said in response, Dad, I love you too. And we never ended a conversation after that where we didn't tell each other we loved each other. And you know what I found I was doing as a result of that? I would come home on weekends when I wasn't playing in a sport and I would help him mow the lawn, rake the leaves and wash the car. And I remember thinking to myself at that time, I, wasn't, I wanted to come home, rake the leaves, mow the lawn, wash the car to show him how much I loved him. But I could have come home week after week, raking the leaves, mowing the lawn, washing the car to try and earn his love. But there's an eternal difference between the motivation, even though the act might be the same. Everyone who has this hope fixed upon him of how deeply we're loved by him, our motivation for all we do in the Christian life, our motivation for our obedience, for studying scripture, for being in prayer, for being in fellowship with other believers, for giving of our resources to help and encourage other people, all of that should be motivated by this primary thing, that this Father who knows you, loves you. 
And it seems to me, if we've got that down and we begin to understand that, it seems to me that this is a message that is so precious that we would want to tell others about God's love as well. So that they might enter in to the knowledge of how deeply they are loved by him. Let's pray. Father, I worship you for the privilege that I have had this day to remind people of that thing that we ought not ever to forget, that we are deeply, deeply loved by you. And oh, Father, I pray that each person here would be encouraged and that each person would find their life, their decisions, the words they say of encouragement to others, the words they say of gospel proclamation to others, the words that are evident in their life and the character that's evident in their life would all be lived on this foundation that each one in this room is deeply loved by the God who bears the stain because he loves a child. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. With heads, I want to ask us just to remain with our heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment of privacy and concentration. And uh, I'm so grateful for that message, but as I reflect on so many of the truths we were taught, I think that I think that what Dr. Root taught on about God's love for us is a truth that's lost on so many of us, even though we hear it so many times. And uh, I think Christianity begins, it begins with understanding and receiving the love of God into our lives. It's the love of God that drives us to a real saving faith. It's the love of God that redeems us and calls us to growth and obedience. And uh, there are some of you here today, you have been working for the love of God rather than receiving it. And I just want to give you an opportunity to confess that to God, saying, Lord, I want to receive your love. I don't want to earn it anymore. I want to receive what you're trying to give me freely. And if that's you this morning, I'd love for you just to put up your hand and say, yeah, pastor, that's me. I've been trying to earn God's love and I just need to receive it. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand back there. I see that hand over there. And I just ask you to pray in your heart with me, Lord Jesus, today I choose to receive your love. I thank you for loving me in spite of my sin. Because I receive the truth that you love me in spite of my sin, I also receive your forgiveness for my sins. And today I choose, because of your grace, not to walk in condemnation, but to walk in freedom as a recipient of your unconditional love for my life. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said amen and amen. Can we give a round of applause for a few people who just made a big step today? Very exciting. Um, what we're going to do right now is uh, we're going to transition the service into a new segment. And uh, I'd like to ask you to pass the connect pads from the end of each row. And uh, if you're on the left end of your row, that's where the connect pad is. And I really want you to pass it. I think it's a really cool way that we um, make a big church feel small and connected. And my favorite part about our church, it's not the, the, the message or the music, it's the community. And this is part of how we do that. So I'd ask you to pass that down the road. Let us know you're here. If it is your first time, check the first time box and we will send you a gift of bunnies in the mail. Just kidding, we won't. That would be terrible. Why would you ever want bunnies? We'll send you a gift card in the mail for coming and checking us out and being a part of our family today. We're also gonna go into a time of giving, and giving is just another way that we worship God. And I love getting to be a part of all that God is doing here financially. Um, if you feel uncomfortable with giving, I want you to know God doesn't want your grumpy money. He wants your heart. And I just like to remind people of that. And um, my wife and I give online because it's the smartest and most efficient way to give here. And I'd ask you to consider doing that. You can do that at first.church slash give. Um, or if you want to give in the offering plate, the deacons are going to be passing that by in a minute. But uh, let me just pray for the rest of the service. Jesus, I ask you bless and multiply this offering. Again, we thank you for that great message and the new life that we've seen here this morning. Uh, you are faithful and you are just and you are loving. And we receive all of that this morning. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen.